John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. John Anik and Kenny Florian. I fucking love them. I can't get enough of them. Let's hear that boss tonight. Big jab there from Duffy and Brett Beer is hurt now. Oh. Down goes Duffy on court. Brett Beer does it again. Rock him, suck him, robot here. Oh my goodness. I can't believe there are a couple of absolutely self-involved bullshit artists. Here are your hosts, John Anik and Kenny Florian. What a week. What a week in New York City. For me, it was actually like 36 hours, but uh, <laughs> UFC 244 is in the can. Probably the most intense fight atmosphere I have ever been a part of. It is Monday, November 4th, 2019, episode 224 of the Anakin Florian podcast, starring Kenny Florian. I wasn't going to open the show with this because he doesn't want me to. Uh, he'll be, he won't even post about it on his Instagram page. But uh, you don't enter the Long Beach International Open unless you're trying to win the thing. And I just want to let the listeners know that over the weekend, Kenny Florian competing in jiu-jitsu at the black belt level at whatever fucking age, Keith Florian. <laughs> uh, Ken Flo got it done. His medal is not bronze. It is not silver. It is gold. His daughter was in the building. And uh, that's where we start today, kid. Congrats. <laughs> Thank you, man. I forgot to mention it on the last podcast. Can you that imagine? You were competing because yeah. you didn't want to make me nervous while I'm calling the fight. You know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I am competing again next weekend, just to let you know. Oh, well, competing in no gi, no gi okay. next weekend. Uh, so there, there's a lot of tournaments here in LA. So I was like, you know what? I want to compete in the no gi world championships in December. That's the big guy. That's wow. the big one. So I, I, I need to, I want to get used to kind of uh, competing, getting back in there. And to see if the body will hold up for the no gi yeah. world. In December. <laughs> when is, uh, where That's is that other happening? Where is that uh, happening? That is going to be, I think in Anaheim, either Anaheim or Irvine. One of the, one of the places in the OC. You know, I don't know. I might, I might have to be in the, uh, in the crowd there with true Florian for the <laughs> no gi world championships in December. If the schedule will align, you know, Kenny's brother, Keith, uh, his longtime chief corner in the UFC said something like king of the old guys. And I don't <laughs> care how old you are. You enter the tournament, you leave with gold. Sounds like the body held up, which is a very good thing. Yeah, I'll tell you right now, any 60-year-old out there can get it. Let's go. <laughs> Let's you. go. 1976 <laughs> or earlier, come <laughs> fucking get it. Ken Kenny, right. let, Kenny, uh, time, to, time to get on that combat jiu-jitsu mat. How about that? There you go. Let's go. There you go. S slapping people's faces. That'd be fun. We call them palm uh, strikes for the record. It's not slap fighting. Go. It's stop, very stop. We, we talk about that in production meetings all the time, Kenny. Not slap gotcha. fighting. Imagine Pops. if TJ DeSantis was charged with uh with calling your fight. Well, hey, yeah, if uh go. if you keep competing like this, it's inevitable TJ on the jujitsu circuit is gonna end up calling one of your <laughs> Right. You and, and think about that next time I uh fuck up the pronunciation of the week, Kenny. All right, buy brownie points that's now. That's true. That's like, true. Like 21 minutes from right now when you <laughs> put your uh, Dalsha's last name. Right. So, uh, all right, we're going to rip through UFC 244. We're going to try to give it as much attention over the next 45 minutes as humanly possible. Ray Longo coming up here in about seven minutes. So this BMF title fight went down. And, Kenny, I just want to first start with the atmosphere, as I often do. I don't know if it was the presence of the president of the United States of America and the accompanying Secret Service, which just heightened everything, or the fact that Madison Square Garden appeared at capacity very early on in the night, which doesn't always happen on a pay-per-view evening. There was a tension and an electricity in this building that I haven't necessarily experienced as a commentator. And uh, as great, you know, we're two day, two years to the day of UFC 217. You see the, the banner behind me commemorating it. But this was a crazy night, a crazy circumstance with the BMF title fight. And uh, what a weekend in New York, my man. And I think it's a testament not only to the strength of the card, but also uh, the strength of this main event uh, of two guys that are legitimate uh, superstars in this sport due to their last few fights uh, with Nate Diaz obviously uh, goes back a little bit further uh, but for Jorge Masvidal and everything he's accomplished recently and his style of fighting and Nate Diaz's style of fighting and just their uh, personalities colliding here I think that's why we felt this kind of energy. I haven't been this excited for a, a pay-per-view card in a long time. I thought that it delivered um, you know, I will get into it later, but Jorge Masvidal's performance was one of the more brilliant mixed martial arts performances yeah. that I've seen in a long time. I would put it up there against any performance, um, not only because of how technical and how sharp and how good he was and the quality of his opponent, but also the fact that it was a true 
full mixed martial arts experience. This was a guy that really threw everything at Nate Diaz uh, and just seemed to be better in every aspect. I was blown away, man. Jorge Masvidal is a fucking amazing martial artist. He really is. And Tyron Woodley certainly has been saying for the better part of five years that he's the best boxer in the UFC. And he showed you a lot of those skills and then some over the weekend. It's almost disappointing we sit here on Monday morning and he's not an undisputed UFC champion because yep. it feels like that performance was sort of worthy of a belt, even if it didn't come against Kamar Usman or Colby Covington. 35th pro win. Right in a career of 48 fights now that dates to 2003, he's as hard as his opponent Nate Diaz is to put away. Uh, what else can you tell us technically about the performance that blew you away to such an extent? And and I'm happy to hear that you were this excited for this fight because candidly, when there isn't an undisputed title, right. you know sometimes it's hard to get to that level. But clearly, you were there. And that's what's so cool about it, right? Yeah, there was the the BMF belt and all that stuff on on the line, but that's not what brought people in. It was these two personalities colliding with all these skills. For me, Jorge Masvidal, his ability to just be effective defensively, he never let Nate Diaz get started. I don't know if Nate Diaz really landed a clean punch, maybe one, and it looked like Jorge smiled and returned with a beautiful combination. But Nate was trying to put the pressure on him. And what people get stuck doing against Nate Diaz, they get backed up against the cage and they can't get out of there. Nate Diaz destroys your body, then takes your head out later on in the fight. Masvidal never let Nate get anything really going. His ability to pivot, his ability to turn, get Nate Diaz's back against the cage. Um, He was defensively sound. He was offensively sound. Just so precise with everything that he did. His wrestling was on point. Never put himself in a bad position on the ground. That is a clean performance, dude. I mean, that is masterful. It's not even oh, you're a good fighter, you're a great fighter, Uh, that was, you know, you showed a lot of toughness. This was a technical and precise performance uh, from a surgeon in Jorge Masvidal. He's really evolved his game, and he has gotten more aggressive. I mean, certainly if you look at his fight history, and and it's well documented at this point that that he's never been finished in the UFC, but four of those, go ahead, Flo. Uh, And and I was going to say, that the other thing I wanted to say, sorry, um, was if you look at him physically, right? Well, what's more impressive to me as a martial artist, there's nothing that stands out physically. He's not a, a guy that uh, physically looks imposing like a Yoel Romero. He's not known for his strength necessarily. He's not known for this amazing power. He's not known for this amazing speed. So he knows something that others just don't. To me, that's intriguing. To me, that is different. To me, that is special. He yeah. understands martial arts on a level that others just just do not. Right. Well, and, and that speaks to his lifetime in the game. And I think it was heightened by this time he spent away on that reality show where he was just void of cell phones and distractions and physically and mentally got himself to a place. I mean, dude, when he got back from that reality show physically, he when he fought Darren Till, right, uh, I don't know if he's kept that acumen up to that extent, you know, yes. but uh, a regiment, he is – certainly a different beast than he was at times in his UFC career when he just wouldn't necessarily go for it late in fights for one reason or another. And I'm not saying that the skills weren't necessarily there, but the confidence now is there of a champion. I mean, he fights with the confidence of an undisputed champion. And I do hope that he gets the opportunity to fight for the undisputed UFC welterweight championship because what he's done in 2019 is certainly fighter of the year type stuff i mean at this point i feel like adesanya has got to get to have a real tough time sweeping the hardware at the end of the year because of what masvidal has been able to do yeah. uh we're going to talk about this fight over the course of the entire show but i have to acknowledge before we bring on ray longo the toughness of nathan diaz because on a night where we saw Boagoy ivanov and vicente luque absorb like life-threatening damage they were the second and third toughest guys Talk to me, Flo, about Nate Diaz's toughness. I think he's the toughest fighter I've ever seen, at least in terms of his ability to absorb head trauma and and trauma to the body, right? Like, I I can't even – I don't even know what else to say, man. I'm out of superlatives. Uh, Nate Diaz is an absolute savage. Um, He's a guy, like I said, and I said this in the last podcast, there's guys that will keep fighting when it gets tough. There's guys that will keep fighting when it gets really, really tough. There's few guys that will fight to the death. Nate Diaz is one of those guys. He has no problem 
putting his life on the line to prove a point that he's the better fighter. That's how tough he is. He takes an insane amount of punishment in his fights. And now let's put this into perspective of the course of his career. This is what he's been doing for years and years and years. So it's just mind-boggling the kind of um, pain tolerance that this guy can sustain. His hunger, his motivation to win a fight is unlike anything out there. Nate is an OG for a reason. There's a reason why everyone wanted to see this fight. There's a reason why people will continue to wa to watch Nathan Diaz fight. Yeah. Uh, he's a stud, and um, I again, I I'm just amazed by him as well. Um, and again, this is what makes Jorge Masvidal's performance so impressive, is that he did this against a Nathan, D Nathan Diaz um, who's at the top of his game right now. Yeah, he is. Couldn't have much more respect for for Nathan Diaz and defeat over the weekend. All right, today's Ray Longo Minute brought to you by OddsShark.com. OddsShark, your source for the latest odds from leading authorities, expert editorial content, and detailed matchup picks with expert in-depth analysis for each game. Their free statistics, numbers, and trends will help you make the sharp picks on game day. Head over to OddsShark and start playing like a shark today. OddsShark.com. Don't forget that second S. All right, let us get to Ray Longo. Now time for the Ray Longo Minute. I want you to punch a hole in this fucking chest. That's what I want. The Ray Longo Minute. Starring Ray Longo. The John Anik and Kenny Florian Podcast. Well, if I know Ray Longo the way I think I know Ray Longo, Ray Longo enjoyed the piss out of that Jorge Masvidal <laughs> Nathan Diaz fight over the weekend. Oh, I, mean, I tell you, I, 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 thought, I thought the whole night was the ambiance, everything. The fights were great. That fight lived up to its expectations. Uh, I wish it didn't end the way it en ended, but I got to agree with one, one thing Kenny said that I have to agree with. It's not how tough he is. He's been doing this forever. That's the thing that the, the, the mindset that you need to, you know, you can do it a couple of fights, but this guy can keep going forward, take pain. And he's in the fight. It's not like he's out of the fight. You know what I mean? So, you know, he had his moments in that fight. We don't know what would have happened in rounds four and five. So, uh, you know, they're both, I, I like, again, any other two guys I wouldn't have bought into that whole shit. But these two guys, they deserved it. They delivered. The place was sold out. Like, again, you were there, John. The ambiance was phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. I, I wasn't even going to go, and I had the best time of my life. I, you know, luckily... Uh, I, I mean, we all ended up sitting together, which was great, uh, and it was just a f fantastic night. See, Kenny, I just wanted to piggyback on the ambiance, yeah. right? Because here is Ray Longo, a lifetime in the fight game, who just told our audience unsolicitedly that this was one of the best nights of his life, right? What was it, Ray, about? Was I... I, you know, wherever you fall politically, I think some of it had to do with the fact that the president of the damn United States was in the building. I mean, that had that was part of it for me, certainly calling of the course. fight. Why was this night yeah. so special for you, though? Just just Masvidal and well, Diaz and everything well, else? I, I, th I think what happened with me, look, it was the, there were a million fights that delivered. Obviously, I love Wonder Boy. I thought he painted a masterpiece against a oh, yeah. really tough guy that, man, just to watch him move and cut the angles, side kicking the guy off his feet. I mean, if you're a fight fan and you appreciate, like, martial arts, that was a beautiful fight, man. It really was. And, and Luke is as tough as they come. He was on a how-many-fight win streak. So, for me, like, again, I teeter-tottered on not going, and Al had a ticket, and I was with a couple other guys. And then I, it, it so happened that I ended up with Al, Al Joe, uh, Matt, and his wife, Volante. So, we had a lot of great people around, which always is a great night for me because, Sometimes we get to go out and eat together, and we have a we have fun. But to be at a fight and partying a yeah, little bit and screaming, cool. and and the fights delivering, and every fight is exciting, and the ambiance and the president coming in and the Rock walking in. I don't know. That night was. Uh, I thought that night was a special night, and the beautiful thing about it was Nathan Diaz orchestrated that whole night. He called out Masvidal. There was respect between two guys that were going to go throw down. They delivered. He had to endure a, a bad first round. Like, what else do you want? It was just a great night. I think it was a win-win for everybody. Well, you guys are making me jealous that I wasn't there. Uh, Ray, Ray um, you know, as far as Jorge Masvidal's performance, man, in my mind, it's one of the more impressive, full, mixed martial arts 
performances that I've seen uh, in a long time. I mean, he, he was able to really do everything out there, and he did it against Nathan Diaz. Uh, what do you think of his performance and his uh, potential to maybe be a champion in, the, in this division? Look, this guy is coming into his own for sure. I mean, he's always been in his own, but he is, look, yeah. I've always been high on Masvidal. I never bet against him. This fight, you know, obviously I love Nate, so I was behind Nate, but these are two guys, two stand-up guys that, like, again, I think they're both willing to die in there, and I'm going to tell you this, anybody who's going to fight Masvidal in that type of fight is definitely not winning. They're not winning. Uh, you know, like, again, if you want to, you know, uh, you know, if you're going to take him down and, you know, you're going to play that game, you probably, that's your best shot, but if you're going to stand up with this guy, you're probably uh, not winning. You know, he's, he's, He's that good, I think. He knows how to pick his shots. He, he Look, those body kicks were hard. Uh, he throws with bad intentions. And that was the game for me. Could he stop uh, Nate from, you know, throwing a lot of volume at him? And for the first three rounds, it was working. But I, I'm not sure. You know, I think at one point, you know, he figured, look, I'm not going to knock this guy out. i got to start conserving my energy. And uh, I would have loved to have seen rounds four and five. I really would have. Matter of fact, I would have liked to have seen rounds four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. I don't think either of those guys were stopping. Yeah. No. You know. So. Yeah. So I guess when when Jorge Masvidal was walking back to the stool after round three, you know, I saw maybe something different, John. There. A yeah. Little so bit. no, right. So I thought at that point, finally, he showed maybe a modicum of frustration that he hadn't been able to get Nate Diaz away. I wouldn't go as far yeah. as to say he was fatigued yeah. or anything. Um, right. But in terms of the cut, what is your understanding as to uh, to what should be done in that situation? And do you think ultimately how did all parties handle it? Cut man, doctors, things like that. Uh, look, the cut was pretty bad. But I, if I'm, I, I mean, I think I would have said uh, to the referee, listen, and I would have told Nate, you got, you got one more round to do this and then I have to stop the fight and I would have told the ref if he's in bad shape taking the beat and just stop it immediately but I would have offered him I believe I would have offered him the opportunity to at least go out there and make a you know try to you know throw a Hail Mary at that point you know what I mean just to give him that that thing and I it looked confusing to me it looked like Nate thought the doctor was going to okay it and he just walked away and I, I do kind of believe what he said so you know, that, that's the way I would have liked to have seen it. But, look, on the other hand, you always have to protect the fighters. And you know a guy like Nate is not going to stop whether, you know, he's he's you know he's the guy in uh, Monty Python's Holy Grail. You know, he gets his legs chopped <laughs> off. It's just a, just a mere flesh wound. It's you only know a I mean? flesh wound. If, yeah. If, if you think you're going to ask Nate Diaz, you want to stop because you got a cut on your eye, which you've had 20 other yeah. times, you're out of your mind. You know what right, I mean? Yeah. So... I would have liked to have just given him an opportunity on the careful observation. It's just like when Nate Diaz takes a podium at a post-fight press conference and says, like, I didn't die in there. You know, it's not to be funny. It's not. I mean, it, it's Seriously. literally right to your point earlier that he's going in there with every intention that if that's what happens, so be it. Uh, yeah. I, yeah and, look, and listen, yeah. He, he absolutely means it. And, and I think. The big, the big problem is all of us wanted to see more of that fight, right? I, I mean, those right. guys were really putting on a show. And I, I think we've also seen Nate Diaz come back in fights how many times? I, I mean, he, he turns it on in the fourth and the fifth. Uh, Without also a doubt. Seen, And it seemed like he had some kind of an issue, you know, heading into camp or whatever, where he, he said he couldn't train the same way. I, I believe it. I don't think Nate Diaz is going to BS you at all. But um, that, that was frustrating. But... I don't have a problem with the stoppage myself. I think the cut was awful. I, I, I want to see a cut that's going to be able to be healed up and, and not going to give him a, 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 ma a major issue heading forward. You know, it's tough at this point. He's been fighting a long time. Uh, but also, I think the, the other main reason for the cut, if we're being honest, is that he was taking a lot of damage out there. And he wasn't able to see Jorge Masvidal was really kind of putting it on him. Uh, and... I didn't think it was necessary for him to take more damage moving forward, especially with everything that was kind of compromised for him uh, heading into that fourth. Yeah, that's certainly, that's fair. That, that's that's fair. You know, it's uh, like, again, we get a little greedy because we want to see it. And yeah, we it want, you know, we're pulling for guys to do good. But, uh, 
like again, at the end of the day, it is safety first. I would all like again for me, I would have given him an opportunity, but under careful observation, and then just stop, yeah. step in, and that way, you 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 know you solve that problem. You you let the guy at least have a chance to do something, and you're also watching him so it doesn't get worse. But look, that eye is going to need uh, you know severe attention anyway. If he's going to yeah. move on in the future, the cut the cut was pretty bad for sure. Yeah. Well, there were plenty of us that were concerned going into this fight that the Showtime Pettis fight, <clears throat> excuse me, was only seventy seven days ago, and that was a wound that potentially could be reopened. You parlay that yes. or couple that, Kenny, with with Nate Diaz's history and the scar right. tissue because of that history, and uh, this was not an outcome that was unforeseen by everybody out there. Hey, last thing for me, Ray on Masvidal, and yeah. then I do want to talk about WB for a second. So one of the best parts for me of this job is when we have a new UFC champion, a new undisputed UFC champion, because it's just it's the moment, right? It's just the moment that every fighter dreams of. And it's so hard to get there. And even though George doesn't have that moment, he hasn't had necessarily the life changing paydays the way Nate Diaz has. And for me, one of the best parts of this is that George Masvidal has a million Instagram followers and is one of the biggest superstars in the sport now and is going to make life changing money. Because from a martial arts standpoint and just a good guy standpoint, you know, he's richly deserving. He was hugely deserving of this showcase, this fight. And I'm just happy that a really good dude from from Dade County was able to maximize it, you know. Oh, look, exactly, man. These are both. And I got to tell you, and I think Nate realizes that. And he that's why he I, he gave him the platform. I mean, you got to. Exactly. Hats off to, I think it's a win win for Nate all around. You know what I mean? I think he did the admirable thing. He could have called out anybody. Who does he call out? This killer? Are you kidding? So he Man. does the right thing. And I, I think Nate really believed this is a guy that's been around forever, that's not getting his just due. I think he was in that position one time, and he was right in the wrong. And I think you got to hats off to Nate even for even thinking like that. He could have definitely taken an easier fight. But, uh, you know, this fight, I don't know. That, that's the... The beautiful thing about this was it was two guys that should be fighting in the main event that nobody had to promote, nobody had to get yeah. involved with. And the people spoke. The people spoke. They showed up. And that's all that matters, man. You know yeah. what I mean? So as much as I like the other chance and all the other stuff going, you know yeah. what? These guys produced, man, for a long time. I'm just bummed now because when fans ask me what my favorite UFC live event is, I'm going to have to say it was one that happened at Madison Square Garden, you know? Now look, it, uh, John. That was it. Was I mean, I don't know how it was for you, but I'm uh, I, for me, and I'm telling you, I thought the ambiance yeah. was was phenomenal. You know, yeah. I just did. I don't know, baby. Then you're right. There was yeah. a lot of factors. It was great fights, great main event. The president, the rock. I, I don't know what else was was happening, but you know, I I don't know. For me, I was with guys that I give a shit about. That you know, I don't get a chance to to really hang out with on that level a lot. It was just, it was, it was good, man. And again, I was mad at texting me one time of year there. I said, I'm still home. I mean, I, I got there late and it just worked out better. Just for me, it was a great, great night. Good, man. All right. Last thing before we let you fly, because I know you're pretty close with Stephen Thompson and his father, Ray. I will, will never forget the visual of him after getting knocked out by Showtime Pettis, sitting on the stool in Nashville, Tennessee, stool in the middle of the octagon after getting knocked out cold by that roundabout Superman punch. And Thompson sitting there thinking like, man, this has never happened before, really. You know, something like this, right? I've been doing these right. striking competitions, you know, since I was 15 years old. I'm 36. What the fuck is this, right? And everyone's wondering right. how he's going to come back, right? And he just, in my humble opinion, turned in the shining performance of his entire career in front of the the best crowd of his career. And I just feel good for a guy who a lot of people were wondering if his better days were behind him. And uh, clearly that does not appear to be the case. And again, uh, John, a super nice guy. You can't find a nicer guy than Wonder Boy Thompson. You and love again, nice guys. A tough guy. I, I think he painted a masterpiece. I really do. The movement was beautiful. And again, he didn't sidekick him off his feet once. He did it, what, twice? That's not easy to do. You know what yeah. I mean? So Luke, as tough as they come, wasn't going to quit. Wonder Boy was good to see him. He, he fought at range perfectly. But every so often, he, he sat in the pocket, he threw some hard combos. I know uh, I texted with his dad after. I think he broke his right hand somewhere in the fight. And then I talked to Weidman. He said he broke both hands. So he definitely uh, he laid it out there. I hope he's all right. 
But I thought that was, I thought that's the best. I, I text this far. I go, that's the best fight I've ever seen of him, period. How about that? Unbelievable. You know? All right, man. So, well, uh, uh, I'm, I'm bummed that I didn't get to see you, but I was very excited yeah, to that's, see that's you on the social only, media. That's that the only the negative of the night. I didn't get a chance to see you. There you besides go. There that, you go. Home run. And, Anik's overrated anyway, Ray. I, I, I think so. Oh. I think so. Anik's yeah, got a so. lot of love, Kenny. You don't know. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. A lot he's of love this guy I'm got. I'm just pissed because I don't, I don't get to see the guy. Fucked yeah, up. we got to get Kenny I mean, back in the loop. No? This is horseshit. <laughs> Ray, I think you and I, he's competing in the Nogi World Jiu-Jitsu Championships in December, so we got to fly to Anaheim. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> where where are they? Floor, Anik and Florian Podcast will we'll buy you a first-class ticket. No, we can't. I'm close to doing that. But uh, we'll fly in, Coach. No lay flat for you, but we'll fly to Anaheim. In, no, uh, seriously, I, I, I appreciate it. I'll take an Amtrak ticket. I'll be there. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, hey, hopefully UFC Unfiltered, that, that UFC podcast, is, uh, is paying you enough so that you can still make these appearances for not much money, you know. I, I got to tell you, I can't even carry the money to the bank. It's so heavy. It's <laughs> yeah, I know. Crazy. I know. I mean, I, hey, I know there's going to come a time where you're going to come tell us that they want you full time, and uh, and that thereby <laughs> could be the end of the Ray Longo minute. What are you going to do? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think that'll ever happen. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to burn the place down the last time I was on. I didn't think I was ever going back on again. Yeah. Oh man. All right, buddy. Have a uh, have a great week. Thanks for your time, as always, sir. All right, guys. Take it easy. Thanks, Ray. All right, there he is, Ray Longo, every week, dating to episode one here on the yeah. Anik and Florian podcast. Also a staple of the show, the pronunciation of the week, 13 and 10 for TJ DeSantis after a hit on Jarzinho Rosenstrike last Monday. Uh, a little tougher this week for him, Ken Flo. This is a South African light heavyweight. Won his UFC debut in June in Minneapolis, Minnesota, TJ. How about that? Uh, now he will face Magomed Ankalaev in Moscow this Saturday. Probably butchered his opponent's name, but... I'm not judged on this segment, that's for sure. TJ is to go to 14 and 10 on the year, TJ. Who are we talking about, kid? Dolsha Lungiambula. All right, so it's it's wrong for me because the first syllable, but let's hear Dolsha champion say his name. Lungiambula Dasha, the true champion. Lungiambula Dasha, the true uh, champion. Uh, he said it twice, differently. Uh. So uh, that's going to be a no for me, dog. <laughs> um, no, first of all, that is the, without a doubt, the hardest fucking name in the history of all sports. Are you kidding me? TJ should get a half point just for trying. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I think I should get a full point. Dude, it, I heard right. it twice. I won't even attempt it right now. I won't even attempt. Lungiambula. Is, th is that not how he said it? He said so, it that way the second time. <laughs> Ken Flo's God, me right now. I don't know if I can pull together. You, you got to say that live. Woo! So uh, I called his UFC debut. It was an exhaustive process, and I thought about it then. I can't wait to trot this out for <laughs> TJ, but we did have him say it for us in person. It's a very difficult file to interpret, and then when you couple that with it just being a hard name, to your point, Kenny, yeah, it's on the, the top ten list for me. It's Dalsha Lungiambula. I've said it hundreds of times now, so it's very familiar uh, for me. It is Lungiambula. It is not Lungiambula as written, and we don't do hook points here. No hook, no half point. 13 uh -huh. and 11 for TJ DeSantis uh, on the year. TJ, I tried, man. I had your back on this one. I usually don't, but uh, I would have given you a half point. And the listeners always have your back, so we'll see yeah. if there's enough steam oh, to give wow. you the full point. But I'm not, I'm not, you know. It, it's be, it's because I'm right most of the time. I mean, that's yeah. why you know, <laughs> there's haters over here. All right, well, as a true football fan, you already know it's been another great start to the season. Actually, we've crossed the midpoint now. Every weekend, your favorite players putting their skills to the test. So why aren't you doing the same, well, now is the time, folks, to get off the sidelines and get in the game with my bookie. My bookie is the premier place to bet on all of your favorite pro and college football action every weekend. That is where I bet. They always have the most up-to-date lines, the most prop bets of any sports book on the planet. You can also bet on games live after kickoff. I'm a big live wagering guy. If by the second half, maybe it looks like your bet is going to lose, you can hedge a little bit, maybe you go the other way. And of course, as we always tell you, if you're not winning Long Beach International Open and you don't have that KenFlow bankroll, not to worry. Maybe you just bet a little, win a lot. It's called a parlay. All your picks come through. You multiply your winnings. But regardless of how you do choose to attack the board, the best part is if you join my bookie right now, my bookie will double your first deposit 
That is right. If you put in $1,000, they will give you $1,000. bucks. Double your initial deposit. Use the promo code ANICFLORIAN to activate the offer. That's promo code ANICFLORIAN. One word, ANICFLORIAN. Visit mybookie.ag today. You play, you win, you get paid. All right, now joining us uh, to look ahead to Moscow and Sao Paulo, but of course to look back at what was UFC 244, Ian Parker is live from South Florida, and Ian Parker is not picking up his children today. Sounds like the Parker family got the memo that if they were going to be a long-term fixture on the Anakin Florian podcast, they needed to start showing some commitment, and uh, we appreciate that you are not on the road today. Ian Parker, how goes your Monday, kid? Well, that is my wife's birthday, so for her birthday, wow. she went and picked up my son. So this is like a really weird, I feel like I'm being fucking set up right now, but <laughs> she is, uh, she, she loves the podcast, she like, you know, she's, she's happy with the situation, so she's like, you know what, I'm going to go good. pick him up, I don't need you to rush your picks. She wants the momentum yeah. to carry over and keep burying Kenny Florian every weekend. I love it. Let's go. It. Well, well, I'm not going to wish her a happy birthday. Because, you know, it's the first time in like 30 Mondays she's agreed to this situation. But maybe down the line, uh, if this trend continues, she'll get a happy birthday out of me. But we do appreciate your sacrifice. And uh, I always love your texts on Fight Night, Ian. Uh, love doing the Instagram live <laughs> with you, which we did on Friday with Ken Flo. And, of course, on Saturday, you and me. What what a crazy fight atmosphere. You know, we, we talked about it with Ray Longo. For me, this was probably the most festive, special intense fight atmosphere that I that I've ever been a part of yeah I mean listen I, I was sitting here watching this from home with uh just the fights didn't disappoint man you know it, it was crazy it seemed like everyone was into it you know between the rock I mean however you feel about the present just overall and one of my favorite parts is when all these knockouts happen the reactions between you Rogan Dom Megan Olivia everyone is amazing and then, and then you hear your voice over all of theirs with the reaction, it just makes it that much better. But man, what a fucking night! That was awesome. Really, what if you it don't really like the rock? Toes. What if you don't like the rock? You know, it's so funny. Like all of us have to couch. Nobody, nobody about, doesn't like. The rock. I know, that's of course. Lot, yeah. Well, that's that's the point. Is that his public approval rating is as high as any celebrities ever probably right but i just think it's funny how every time anybody even invokes the president of the united states into this conversation because of the climate you have to qualify it or couch it a little bit right juxtapose against the rock who is just as beloved as it gets and and we shouldn't shortchange the rock in terms of what he brought to fight week in this event because uh it certainly made it more festive as far as the fight is concerned ian parker jorge masvidal nate nate diaz uh what were your thoughts on the 15 minutes that we saw this weekend well, you know, I, I wrote to you beforehand that I, that I, was, I laid some nice money on Masvidal late because that was a really up-and-down, crazy betting night for me. Um, yes. Masvidal looked unbelievable. I thought, first off, how, I can't believe these two go into this fight and Masvidal has the, uh, the humor side of it, his personality of fake the running me, and Nate reciprocated that humor. And it, it was really good to see the level of respect between the two, you know, and that fight was just, oh, man, Masvidal was flawless. He looked good. He didn't let the bright lights get to him. He shined in his moment. And Nate is just so tough, man. There's just no quit. Although we already know that about the Diaz brothers. But how many people would have been finished by that combo, that hook to that kick? I mean, that kick was almost illegal. You know, the way how low right. Nate dropped. And, and Masvidal wasn't slowing down. Listen, as a fan, I wish it went five rounds. We've seen worse cuts. The New York State Athletic Commission is kind of known for being a little bit soft. And it's a shame, but that cut was pretty significant. Here's the thing, though. I don't think Masvidal was slowing down. I think, if anything, you, you know, it would have just kept going. But, uh, man, Masvidal, if I was him, either give him Connor for that payday or let him get the winner for a title shot because what a year yeah. for that guy, man. Unbelievable. Kenny, am I wrong in thinking that 99% of fighters in that weight class get finished by that combination? I mean, what You're the not fuck? wrong. You're not wrong. The only that that one or maybe point one percent is Nate Diaz. That that's yeah. the only reason. I mean, uh, again, his performance was masterful. That that was absolutely a surgeon at work, man. I, I was I was blown away, and it just for me, it just gets more and more impressive with each day that passes. Ken, I want to lead with you on Kevin Lee. His back was up against the proverbial wall. This was a huge fight to kick off the pay per view against the thirteen and zero Gregor Gillespie. Gillespie was the betting favorite. Kevin Lee said this was the most dangerous fight that he has ever signed a contract for. 
Uh, and I do just want to say, Gregor Gillespie literally texted me five minutes ago. First time in my UFC career that I haven't spoken on the mic to you about fishing, but just so we're clear what I'm doing in Ken Flo, you can see there's the picture of Gregor Gillespie on the fishing boat, so they haven't winterized it yet. Uh, but how about Kevin Lee, right? So many doubters. He goes to the man who was your head coach in your final UFC fight, Faraz Sahabi, who has really provided a stabling unifying force in that corner. Maybe a lot of things Robert Fall has provided for us is doing that and perhaps and then some. And uh, what a huge, huge moment for Kevin Lee on a night in which he really needed it. Kevin Lee chose the right guy to become his head coach. Uh, for us is just an awesome man and a, and a great coach. Um, I, I did not see that coming. I thought it was going to be Gregor Gillespie taking Kevin Lee down uh, round after round, stealing rounds and winning a decision. Uh, Kevin Lee did a great job of lowering his level. He was staying eye level with a shorter Gregor Gillespie. And I think that's why Gregor was a little hesitant in shooting. The first line of defense is your head. The second line of defense to takedowns are your hands. And him being at that level, I think, uh, made Gregor hesitant and even attempting uh, a takedown there. So uh, I thought Kevin did a good job with his stance. Both guys were a little iffy in the pocket, but more than anything else, to me, and people on Twitter were telling me, well, Gregor Gillespie out-jabbed Kevin Lee. What are you talking about that Gregor Gillespie looked uncomfortable on the feet? He did not look comfortable on the feet. I don't care if he landed a 1,000 jabs on the feet. His his head was straight up. He looked hesitant with his striking. It looked like he was going to get hurt with something at some point. Kevin Lee is still a wrestler. He's not necessarily this unbelievable striker but to me you started to see a knockout happening at some point Gregor Gillespie was biting on the feints he was not fainting his way in he was just trading in the pocket and it's anybody's it's anybody's fight at that point when you're throwing such hard leather in tight like that and I didn't like that for Gregor um and ultimately it was that brutal left high kick by Kevin Lee that Stunned everybody, man. What a shot. That is as brutal of a knockout that you will see. Kevin Lee's back was was kind of up against the wall here, and man, did he deliver a performance against an undefeated and tough-ass Gregor Gillespie. Ian, you got anything for me on, on Kevin Lee and Gregor Gillespie? I, you know, this is how I thought it was going to go down if there was no takedowns involved. I think people tend to forget the level of competition Kevin Lee has been fighting at for a good amount of time. He's not losing to slouches, and this is the first, what, top 10 guy Gregor Gillespie's fighting. You know, we haven't seen Gillespie's stand-up game. You know, we haven't really seen it yet. Obviously, we know his wrestling game's there. His cardio's there. And, and John, you said it, too. Is I think if Kevin Lee gets past the challenge of the weight cut, you know, we got a really good Kevin Lee. And what did I say? If the fight stays standing, there's a huge disparity in that striking department there. And Kevin Lee working for Oz, obviously his stance was very low, which worked out because, you know, with size and being able to avoid the takedown. And, you know, it was just a matter of time, like Kenny said. I think Gillespie looked a little uncomfortable getting hit that much. He's never been hit that much. Uh, he'll bounce back, though. I mean, you know, again, losing to Kevin Lee regardless of a knockout, it's just sometimes people forget the level of competition. And to me, that is one of the biggest factors when a rising star goes against someone who everyone thinks is on the out. I said it. Kevin Lee just needed the right training camp, the right weight class, and a good strategy. And look what we saw. The dude still got so much talent. Ken Flo, Darren Till was back, but he was back in a new division, 185 pounds. He wins the co-main event by split decision over Kelvin Gastelum. And Gastelum certainly, I think, disappointing and will be disappointed when he goes back and watches this one. I talked to Rafael Cordero briefly after the fight, and he's like, what'd you think? And I was like, oh, you know, I, I don't know, you know, as to who won. Uh, weird when you have 30 27s on both sides here. Oof. I do think Darren Till won the fight, uh, despite the fact that there wasn't much output necessarily from him either. But the numbers tell you he was very efficient, engaged in the clinch, which surprised some people. What were your thoughts on, on the Till Gastelum fight? Uh, listen, I, I thought that Darren Till took on one of the most difficult fights that he could have taken at 185 pounds and delivered a fantastic performance. He proved that not only is he a true middleweight, um, but he's a guy who can do some big things in that division. I saw a Darren Till who had way more energy, way more focus. When he came out to me, I was a little nervous for him. He did not look like he wanted to be there. He looked tremendously nervous in my mind. So I was like, ooh, I don't know about this Darren Till. But he went out there and really performed, man. Did a great job of stopping those takedowns. I think Kelvin Gastelum 
didn't hit, didn't really have a lot of success until the third round with his takedowns. Why? Because he was um, kind of pursuing a takedown moving forward instead of waiting for Darren Till to throw and then entering. So his reactive takedowns were money in the third round. It was just too little, too late. He wasn't able to capitalize on those takedowns and get position on Darren Till. And it was great to see that. Darren Till, if you look at his one weakness, obviously it's going to be his grappling, his wrestling, and his ground game. Um, It looks like he really came in more focused uh, on that aspect of his game. Uh, And again, what a win, man. This just elevated him tremendously in this division. So uh, Ian and I were talking about this, uh, you know, before the fight and, and we were concerned with this matchup. It was not an easy one. Man, did he deliver and just really revitalize his career with a huge win over Kelvin Gastelum. I was one of those doubters. So I'll take one of those fuck yous, Darren Till. Thank you. We can't hear you right now, John. Yeah, I can't hear John at all. No. Can no. you hear me now? Test no, one, there, we there, we there we go. There we go. There we go. What's going on? Sorry, I think I muted it to blow my nose there. I apologize, boys. So <laughs> basically what I was saying as my, my microphone was muted about Darren Till is that I would encourage people to go and just some of the media that is out there on this guy after the fact because to Kenny's point – He says he was almost going to fake an injury backstage because he was so nervous. He couldn't even dance to Sweet Carolina or enjoy his walkout like he is so accustomed to doing in the past. And that was a big part of things. I think he obviously proved a lot to himself in terms of his ability to compete in this weight class. Also said after the fact that he has no interest in fighting a monster like Yoel Romero. He wants this Adesanya fight. You know, I don't know if this is uh, enough to put him in that number one contender spot necessarily. Um, but Ian, do you think Darren Till is now going to be the guy uh, for Israel Adesanya on the strength of this win over KG? I, I don't. Um, I think you know. I think what this fight did was it's going to give him confidence to kind of get rid of that fear and really understand that this is where he belongs in the weight class. I, you know, I, I don't want to. Uh, what's the word? I don't want to knock down Darren Till with this win. You know, I just Kelvin looked really lost out there in the first two rounds until, like what Kenny said with his takedowns, he, he couldn't really get on the inside. Um, Darren Till maybe just did a great job frustrating him using that length, using the reach. Those kiss, those kiss, listen to me, those kicks looked really good. I, I really would, uh, I don't think Till is anywhere close to right for Adesanya. If anything, if you want to keep him at the top, which he has to be, maybe have him fight Jack Hermanson. You know, I think that would be a nice, a nice fight um, at 185, you know, as a real test. I think Adesanya is leaps and bounds ahead again, you know, he surpassed expectations. He got a huge win despite the fear of getting back in there against a really tough Kelvin. But don't, don't rush him into a title fight. Uh, there's really no need for that. But I will tell you, I'm, I'm, I became a really big fan of Darren Till. Some of those interviews, I told yeah. him it's like listening to Brad Pitt in the movie Snatch. I can't understand a fucking word he's saying, <laughs> yeah. but I love it. You know, yeah. it's hilarious. And then the thing with Yo yeah. Romero, his honesty really sells me. You know, it's the first time yeah. we kind of got the, uh, the emotional side of him and, Good kid. Yeah. I'm happy he won for you know for him at age 26. Sky's the limit. Don't don't rush him. Yeah. All right, congrats to Corey Anderson. Huge win over Johnny Walker as he at least momentarily derails the hype train for Johnny Walker Blue. Shane Burgos is incredible as a featherweight. I wish we had more time to give him some love. But you know I carved out at least 120 seconds for the middleweight future, the new breed, Glendale Fighting Club, Armenia, Edmund fucking Shabazian can flow. He was born in 1997. I was a freshman in college when Brad Tavares made his UFC debut. Edmund was 12. He thinks he got to the UFC maybe earlier than he might have been ready to. Uh, but look what he's done, right? Less than a year on the roster. He's now 4 0 in the UFC. And he does against Brad Tavares, at least on paper, what Yoel Romero and Israel Adesanya have not been able to do, and that is put the man away. I'm all in. Chips to the center of the fucking table on Edmund Shabazz. He's going to be fucking shabopping people in the head for a <laughs> long time. He's a he's a beast, man. I mean, uh, I, I love his composure. Again, this is, a, what, he's 21 years old? Uh, I mean, the, the composure, the technique, I was really impressed with this guy. Um, I, I think he needs to be careful when he gets in the pocket a little bit. His head is a little bit uh, too upright. He needs to move it a little bit more when he gets close in the pocket. Uh, but for me, that's the only thing that I saw that he needs to be careful with. Everything else um, was just beautiful to watch. This kid has power. He has speed. Uh, he has composure. 
he is going to be tough to beat, man. I, I love his focus. Um, I, I think he's a guy who really could be a big-time superstar in the UFC, man. I, I'm excited about this kid. And I'm not saying Edmund Shabazian right now is on the level of Israel Adesanya, who is the champion in his division. But when you think about what he's been able to accomplish inside of a calendar year, and then you look at what Adesanya has been able to do and get into 7-0 in the UFC, you know, one thing Edmund's doing that maybe Israel wasn't necessarily doing every step of the way is just putting guys away violently and quickly and viciously. I know the strength of schedules are obviously different, but... Look what he did. I mean, this was a pick'em fight, according to Las Vegas. At least when we did our show, it closed much differently than that because Sharps like you were loading up on Edmund. Um, but Tavares was at the height of motivation, had been off since last July. 17 UFC fights against a who's who of UFC middleweights. And Brad Tavares spit him out like he was, you know, with all due respect, another Jack Marshman. Yeah, you know, this is one of the fights we were talking about on Instagram Live when I said that I was really going heavy, but people were making me a little bit scared because they were pumping up this whole Brad Tavares, you know, emotion, motivation thing, and I, I said, bullshit, I don't care. I, this kid's the real deal. Yeah, listen, it seems to be a theme with these young guys. You know, like to your point, Adesanya, I think it was his second fight against Marvin Vittori that went to a decision. You know, Brad Tavares dominated by decision, and this dude is at 21 years old, and to what Kenny said... I think the most impressive thing about him was his composure and his patience. You know, even in the pocket, Kenny was right. There was a few moments where he got hit a little bit, but his face didn't change. That poker face at that age, unbelievable. And that right hand, I don't know if I've ever seen a more perfect right cross like that. That was bananas, insane. The sky's the limit for this kid. I'm excited. I mean, you know, I'm hoping a year from now we're talking about him versus Adesanya in the main event. I don't care where it is for the title. That's a fight to watch. This kid's got something, man. Unbelievable. And his timeline dovetails with your vision, too. He said by the end of next year, he really believes that he will contend. All right, let us spin this thing forward to Moscow and Sao Paulo. Time permitting a, a few more items on 244 on the back end, but updating the standings here in the main event challenge. 134 to 130 was the lead for Team Florian heading into the weekend. Ian Parker wins the week, folks. 8-6 no. to six was the final. The big swing fight, Kevin Lee as a plus-130 underdog. So the lead is now 2, 140 to 138 for Team Florian heading into UFC Moscow. And because we might actually be dark next week, boys, we are going to need a main event selection today for Sao Paulo. Jan Pohovic versus Jacques de Souza. First fight for us, though, is coming up this weekend. ESPN Plus from Moscow. At welterweight, the former Combat Samba world champion, Ramazan Amib, looking to go to 4-0 in the UFC. Seven straight wins overall. He is the minus 160 favorite here as he faces Anthony Rocco, Martin Rocco, plus 130 here. Ian Parker, who do you like? I like Ramazan uh, Amib here. You know, I, I think his style plays into where Rocco Martin's going to have a little bit of trouble. And I'm not saying he's a Damian Maia level ground guy, but... You know, when it comes to the strength and the physicality, I think he has the edge. I think he'll be able to maintain top control and kind of grind out a win here. Stand-up wise, Rocco striking is okay. He's a very tough fighter, but I just think with the Maya fight, we saw the holes uh, where a grappler can take advantage. I don't think there's much more of a breakdown. To you know, I'll leave that part to Kenny with this one. But I like Ramazan here. I think he grinds this one out. Hey, give me the two syllables. Just my. Uh, let me hear you say Maya. <laughs> Maya? Damien Maya? What did I call him? Maya? Maya? Nailed it. Maya? Nailed it. <laughs> yeah. Maya? Well, no, because I remember when we had breakfast a few weeks ago, I just was, I let it go three times, the Maya, and then I was going to let it go once today, and then when I heard the second Maya, as much as I love you, and my twin brother's going to be pissed because I'm knocking your balls, but two fucking syllables. <laughs> Maya! Maya! He's Maya. a stickler. He's a stickler. You think he does these pronunciations, be, be, you know, because he doesn't like these things? I mean, he's, <laughs> I he's, hey. he's all over you now. Yo, you want to know what's the best part about this? I don't give a fuck because in betting, you don't have to sell up around <laughs> shit. <laughs> I'm just, but John, I am sorry. And I, John, I am sorry. I know that really bothers you. So, uh, I'm honestly, uh, fuck it's, it. I'm done. No, it's all good. It's, yes! It's really, oh, he's done! All, all, I heard, all I heard was I beat Kenny 8-6 this week. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, you're not quitting but the show? Uh, I thought I thought he was quitting. He said he was done. Uh, <laughs> who is that? Who who is that? I haven't heard from him in twelve weeks on the show. Who is that? Keep in mind, I can shut you off at any time, Parker. <laughs> any time. That is true. That is true. He's got oh, all the sorry, power. Wizard of, Man. sorry, Wizard of Oz. My bad. <laughs> uh, Ken Flo, Rocco Martin was on the cusp of welterweight title contention. Had won four in a row before he was neutralized by Damian Maya. 
back in June. Uh, your thoughts on Rocco here against Ramazan Amif? I am tempted. I am tempted to take this because I still want to see more from Ramazan. But am I supposed to go against a, a guy from a wrestling and Sambo background from Dagestan? I mean, it, it's a tough sell for me. I, I would have liked to go with Martin. I, I wouldn't be surprised necessarily if he pulls out the upset. But I, I got to go with consistency. I got to go with a guy that doesn't make a whole lot of mistakes. Uh, I'll stick with Ramazan for the win here. All right, co-main event. Alexander Volkov minus 280 versus Greg Hardy. Hardy the plus 220 underdog. Volkov top five UFC heavyweight. Was training for a five-round main event here against Junior Dos Santos. JDS had to pull out. In steps the dangerous but far less tested Greg Hardy. Short notice fight for him. Very short. Just fought on October 18th in Boston. Many of you may recall that inhaler episode that turned his win over Ben Sassoli into a no contest. Ken Flo leads on the co-main event as always. We'll need the round. We'll need the method of victory. Alexander Volkov, Greg Hardy, who do you like? If both these guys uh, obviously throw down uh, with... with Bad intentions. I, I just think that Volkov's height, his experience, um, is going to be the difference. Now, I, I hope that he learned his lesson uh, against Derek Lewis uh, to not get too crazy in there. He has to be the more technical fighter out there. He can't just let it uh, turn into a brawl. Has to use that reach, come behind that jab. If he's able to do that, he wins this fight and wins it pretty easily. I'd say TKO uh, round one for Volkov. Round one TKO, Alexander Volkov, the pick to click for the Long Beach International Open Open Champion. <laughs> uh, Ian, Volkov has not fought since he was on the wrong end of what was the greatest and still is the greatest statistical comeback in UFC history. It was Derek Lewis, UFC 229. It was all the way back in October of 2018. Volkov did have a main event against Alistair Overeem on the books. He pulled out of that fight back in April for undisclosed reasons. Extended layoff for Volkov here. And an interesting spot for him to return in, Ian. What do you think about Volkov, and what do you think about Greg Hardy making the quick turn? I am actually very shocked that Kenny is so confident in Volkov. And I, I know Greg Hardy's not the be-all, end-all here, right? But what Volkov did against Derek Lewis, you know, he was winning that fight pretty handedly, but there wasn't anything yes. too crazy about that fight. Derek just wasn't throwing anything and just waiting on that right hand. Volkov obviously has the experience. Technically, he's better, but I'm, I'm a little thrown off here with this fight. I don't think it's as easy as a pick as people think. I know this goes against what Kenny and I were saying with the jump in competition, but Styles make fights, and I don't think Volkov is that athletic of a guy. I think Hardy is going to have the strength, going to have the size. He technically looked pretty good with the striking against um, his last opponent. I'm afraid to say the name wrong, so I'm just going to huh. call him the last opponent. All right, but, you know, I kind of want to take Hardy here, at least for right now on Monday. I may change this. I do not think Greg Hardy's getting knocked out in round one. Um, I, I don't. I think his chin can take it. I think his athleticism and his speed is going to help him here. I'm very um, – I'm going to take Greg Hardy to win this one in, a, in I think, a three-round decision here. I just – you know, I think he's getting better, and I think Volkov with a year layoff after getting knocked out like that, I don't know what that's going to do to, a guy, do to a guy like that. I think the athleticism here at heavyweight is where the underdog play is. I'm going to go Greg Hardy by decision. I may change this, but when I said this to John, when the odds came out, I said if it was anything, what, 300 right. pl plus 300 or more, I would go Hardy, right? Yep. Um, I'm going to stick to that. I'm going to take Greg Hardy here. Very interesting. See, I wouldn't be surprised if he just swats the inhaler in the inspection zone and then just goes <laughs> balls to the wall in round one and goes for the first round knockout and – Fuck if he doesn't get it, you know, but uh, I'm a Greg Hardy fan. They're, I'm an they're, Alexander they're, they're in Russia. Inhalers are definitely allowed. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. You could use anything in Russia. I, anything. I, I do yeah. like Volkov too, though, man. It's like if you look at the body of work and you look and you think about what could have been if he had just held on and gotten on a damn bike against Derek Lewis, right? Had yeah. a, a plus 82 strike differential against Derek Lewis in an eliminator type spot, you know, um, and now has been out for, for more than a year. All right. So if you like Ian Parker, you're loving the show today, right? Because now would be the time where he would have to go get his kids. So you're getting Parker overtime today as we transition to the main event in the featherweight division. Three-rounder, because that is what it was initially contracted for. Zabit Magomed Sharipov minus 280. Calvin Cater is plus 220. We will need the round and the method of victory. Ian Parker, who do you like in the Moscow main event? Oh, this is so tough. This is so tough. Um... I think, oh, man, man, you know, Zabit's been 
obviously one of the more highly regarded prospects in a long time. The one thing I've noticed about him, though, in the later rounds, he is starting to fade. You know, cardio has been a little bit of an issue. You know, in the Kyle Bashiak fight, that one was a little concerning to see. I just... I think Calvin is just got the momentum here, too. Um, confidence through the roof. I know he went from fighting in his backyard to fighting down in his opponent's backyard. I'm so tempted to take the underdog here also. I think his cardio is going to be better. I, I like his boxing here. I like his confidence right now. Can Calvin keep the fight on the feet? Can he prevent getting taken down? That's my only concern here. Um, and if he gets taken down, how fast can he get back up? Man, this is this is a really tough <laughs> Um you know what? I'm, I'm, I need to make a comeback here against Kenny. I'm down two points. I already got one underdog. It's Monday. Fuck it. I'm going Calvin Cater. I'm going to take him by decision also right now. I'm hoping his boxing in the pocket and his cardio take this. I'll say Calvin by decision. All right, Calvin Cater by decision. And I think there's going to be a lot of Cater love on the show today, and it's not going to be because there are Massachusetts guys in the room. And, Kenny, I'm going to say with respect to you, who I believe to probably be the best UFC fighter to have come out of Massachusetts. See, you're smiling, but I went, I did all my research today. I looked up all the New England talent, right? Glover to share an account that's Danbury, Connecticut. But, you know, maybe I was really nice to you off the top of the show, but I'm going to sit here and say that with respect to Kenny Florian, Tisha Torres, Joe Lozon, Gabriel Gonzaga, who spent his entire career training out of Massachusetts, John Howard, uh, and anyone I'm forgetting, I do believe Calvin Cater might be the best overall fighter to ever come out of Massachusetts. I think he has the chance to be a world champion. If that is the case, he's got to get by Zabit, who is 17-1, and one, has won 13 straight overall, has never lost in the UFC, has plus skills and finishing instincts in every phase of the game, trains like an absolute maniac. Uh, but I think Cater's on his level, Kenny. I think this fight is closer than the betting odds are, are suggesting. What do you think about Cater and Zabit in Moscow? And, and ultimately, do you, who do you think gets it done? You know, I, I haven't seen enough from, from Cater's grappling. Uh, I would like to see him uh, really improve that aspect of his game. But as, but as far as pure power and boxing technique, um, I'll put him up against anybody on the feet. This is a guy who can knock out anyone. Last time I saw him, I think, was in Sacramento in person. He was massive for the it's division. Big, yeah. uh, he is a big kid, man. Um, I, I hope he makes the weight well, uh, given his travel schedule all the way to Russia. Um, but uh, I, I like him here as well, John. I, I think that Zabit in three rounds would be hard to beat, no pun intended. It uh, is I think three, by the way. Oh, it is. It's not five. Because it was it was originally cr contracted for three because it was going to be the co-main event in Boston. Son of so, a... So, wow. So that does change the complexion of the fight, I think, for sure. Is this the first main event that's three rounds? Well, it... It, there, I think there might have been one or two other uh, circumstances since we went back to right. the five round when, when we went fully to the five round That's main event I mean. several years ago. But I think when you have a circumstance like this where it's contractually going to be three, they, they move the fight back a few weeks. So, um, so over because it's funny because I uh, forgot too as Ian was giving his breakdown that this is yes a fifteen minute fight. Okay, gotcha. So. Mm. This kind of changes things for me because five rounds, I think Calvin Cater will find a way to touch him. Um, uh, three rounds, I think it favors the beat here. Uh, interesting. I well, know. It's hard. Uh, that's why I was yeah, saying three rounds. Well, that's have to give a pick matchup. right now. I mean, we that's can go trickier. to Sao Paulo. I'll I'll go I'll go with Zabit here. I'm no, sorry. I'll go with Calvin here. I'll stay with Calvin here. Um, I, I do think he'll find a way. I, I, I like his chances more if it was a five rounder. Um, but it, it's going to be more challenging in three rounds. The beat moves pretty well um, and has done a good job of utilizing his his length. And as big as Cater is, um, the beat is still going to be a little bit longer and rangier and utilizes his kicks very well to keep him on the outside. I'll, I'll stick with Cater, though. I, I think Cater will find a way to get it done and will get it done by decision. All right, Calvin Cater by decision for Ken Flo and for Ian Parker as well. All right, on the way out, boys, Sao Paulo show is coming up November 16th. We will get your main event selection here for the record. Light heavyweight division, Jan Bojovic minus 205. Jacques de Souza plus 165. As Souza moves up, faces Poland's Jan Bojovic coming off the knockout of Luke Rockhold. Ian Parker, this fight vast, fastly approaching 12 days from now. Who do you got? I'm going to ride the Jan Blahovich train right here. I think that knockout of, Luke, of Luke showed us something. And again, another guy moving up in weight, jumping right into the deep end of the pool. Not that Jan Blahovich is the biggest name out there, but 
he's got to be taken seriously. This fight will probably stay on the feet. Um, and Jacques Rennes good striking. I don't know how the power is going to transition in his weight. I think it's a very dangerous fight for someone who talked about retirement a few times in the last year. Yeah. Uh, man, I know it's in his backyard, but I, I, I don't like this fight for him. I'm going to go Jan Blahovic. I'm going to say TKO round two. I think he's going to finish Jacare. Ken, well, I can't say that Jan Blahovic had a contract to fight for the light heavyweight title, but he was getting very close to getting that John Jones fight. Perhaps if he gets the job done here, he'll be in that mix with Dominic Reyes and uh, and others, certainly Corey Anderson, of course. Um, but I like Bohovich, man. You know, I'm not sure he's ever been as good an all-around martial artist as he is right now. He did lose to Tiago Santos this year, but he has yeah. won five or six overall. He's got a lot of different skills. What do you think about Jan here against Jacare Souza? Listen, I think that Jan um, is coming off a huge win. That is going to build his confidence a, a lot. Uh, I think that he hits very hard. Um, he's a tough guy to take down. He, he's a good grappler himself, certainly not on the level of a Jacare Souza. Um, but I, I think he, his skills right now put him in a, in a, in a very good position to win this fight. Um, I feel like it's sacrilegious to go against a Brazilian jiu-jitsu legend such as Jacare Souza, yeah. but... Um, I think Jacare has slowed down a little bit, um, you know, physically perhaps not the same guy he used to be. Um, and him going against Bohovic right now at this point in his career, I don't love it. Um, I also wanted to go with a round two TKO. Let's go with a round three uh, TKO for Bohovic. So I was doing a little research today. Both Souza and Bohovic lost their pro debuts. But for Jacare, it was all the way back in 2003, Jungle Fight 1. Right, mm -hmm. This dude's competing at the same night Stefan Bonner fought Lyoto Machida. One thing we didn't spend a lot of time talking about was the fact that, at least if my research is accurate, Jacare's never competed in MMA at 205 pounds before. Yes. And he's fighting yes. a big, light heavyweight in I Jan Pahovic. So, uh, got to think that's part of the narrative going in as well. All right, Ian Parker, anything else before we let you fly, kid? Yeah, Johnny Walker cost me a lot of money, but I think he'll have a comeback. I think he'll be all right. I will yeah. tell you one thing, and if Corey Anderson listens to this show, um, I hope he does. I think what he did was absolutely perfect for his career, but he acted like a complete asshole after. And yeah. you got to understand, I don't know who his management team is, but, dude, you knocked out rank number 11. That does not get you a fucking title shot. All right? And I just saw that Dana White mentioned Dominic Reyes is next, which it should be. I would like to see Corey Anderson fight the winner of Jan Blahovich versus Jacare Souza or fight Anthony Smith. Get a real... Top five guy, top three guy, top two guy, yeah. and do the same thing. You know, I, I, you know, Johnny Walker. I don't know where the trash talk really was in that fight. Corey Anderson fought flawless. It was amazing. But you know, talking about either give me a title shot or release me—that's a joke, dude. He's not a marketable guy yet. Just right. Accept the win. You derailed the hype train. It was awesome. Now go fight another top contender and do it again, and then we'll talk about a title. That that shit bugs yeah. me. Yeah, he did apologize for some of the antics after the fact, but yeah, I would agree with you. Uh, I think you have a moment, for John. Yes. You got a moment on the microphone to market yourself, and you know, look what right. look what Israel Adesanya did after the win. You know, yeah. Corey did the exact opposite. And I think he blew yeah. it. All right, my man. Good stuff. Thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to talking to you probably two weeks from today. But we'll be on Instagram Live, and and might have some special YouTube stuff for you guys over the next ten days or so as well. Ian Parker. Thank you very much, buddy. We'll talk to you soon. My pleasure, guys. And Kenny, congratulations on the win, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Thank you. Let's fucking go. Any prize money with that? They give you like a thousand bucks for winning that thing? Or? Bagel. Got a bagel. That's all right. I think you got a nice piece of gold. You know. Good. Next you time, put the gold medal in your fucking mouth. Take have Clark take a picture of you and put it on Instagram so that I can repost it, okay? There we go. There we go. Yeah. See? Uh, see. That's there what I'm go. talking about. Right <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, congratulations to you. We got to get out of here. Thank you to our guests, Ray Longo, Ian Parker. Thanks to everybody who continues to listen every week. Numbers have really been strong, and we appreciate every last one of you. Thank you all for subscribing to the new YouTube channel as well. Please subscribe. Tell your friends that video is worldwide as the audio is, of course. Um, likely off next Monday, I'm going to be at Disney World with my kids. But as I mentioned, we might push out some content on that YouTube channel middle of the week to get you ready for uh, for the Sao Paulo show. Jacare Souza, Jan Pahovic. So, Stay tuned to social media for that next full episode, likely Monday, November 18th, 14 days from today. Till then, Ken Plum, John, and thank you all. Be well. Don't text and drive. Yo, fucking later. 
The John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast is a TJ DeSantis production. Its content is intended for private use only.